Hello everyone and welcome to Mass Analytics Masterclasses where we will try to help you uncover all the hints and secrets behind running your marketing mix modeling project end to end. Today's course is about optimization. In the previous course, we covered modeling. We talked about regression analysis and how this is useful when it comes to marketing mix models. We have also talked about model selection with an emphasis on genetic algorithm as a method to choose the best model. We have also introduced the concept of contribution and ROI and also the trade-off between contribution and ROI. And we have uh, concluded with a, a snapshot of the three main modeling techniques that are really advanced when it comes to marketing mix models, which are nested models, pool regression, and log linear. In this course, we'll be covering mainly two sections. The first one is about how optimization works, and the second one is about a recommended process in order to run your optimization exercise. This pyramid is actually essential to the works of any marketing mix modeling project, and it is composed of three layers. The first one is the measurement. The second one is prediction or forecasting or simulation. The third one is optimization. Actually, optimization, forecasting, and prediction, simulation compose the layer of insight and recommendation that you are meant to give to your client of the back of the measurement that you do in the first layer. Meaning that the more robust is your model, the more you will be capable of providing sound and robust results and recommendation to your clients. I always say that there are two garbage in, garbage out in marketing mix modeling. The first one in the modeling stage. So if you have garbage data, you will get garbage model. The second one is when it comes to optimization and forecasting. If you have a garbage model, you will end up with a garbage optimization and a garbage prediction. So that's why please make sure that first you have great data, so you have a great model, and then make sure that you can have a great model by doing all the statistical tests and all the robustness measures, so you are capable of providing great insight and recommendations to your clients. Looking at our marketing mix modeling workflow, we are now in the last phase of that workflow, which is the deployment phase. Now that I have created the model, I need to make my results actionable. I need to provide insight to the business so they are capable of optimizing their performance and improving the course of their brands. And that's why this is one of the most important components in any marketing mix modeling project and is actually the juiciest part of all the steps. Looking at the Software Master, there is a dedicated module for optimization. Once you create your model, you compute your ROI and your contribution, and you derive your diminishing return curves, you can go straight on to optimization in order to optimize your budget. So how does optimization work? The concept of optimization is based on the concept of creating the diminishing return curve. So what does this diminishing return curve says to us? The more you spend on a specific channel, the more revenue or contribution you get. However, your marginal returns keep decreasing. So the same one additional million that you invest when you are already investing four million will give you less revenue than the same one million if you are at a spend level of six million. So as your spend increases, the return that you'll be getting from each additional dollar will decrease. And it is generally represented by either a concave curve or sometimes an S-shaped curve. Now, as we approach the complete saturation, the slope gets flatter and flatter until you achieve the upper limit. And the upper limit is actually the complete saturation. What does complete saturation mean? It actually means that if you spend an additional dollar on that channel, you will hardly get any revenue. So it's useless for you to spend money on that channel. And that's where you need actually to move money from that saturated channel to a channel that is less saturated than this one. I would like to remind you about a very important concept or a relationship between ROI and contribution that we have covered in course number six, specifically in the course contribution and ROI. We talked about a trade-off between these two entities. What does this mean is actually, as I spend money, I will be getting more and more contribution, but with less and less incremental revenue. 
which means that if I look at my ROI curve, it will be decreasing. As I increase my spend, my average ROI will be decreasing and that's because of the diminishing returns. This means the following, that if I want to optimize between my channels, ROI alone is not enough to create an optimization exercise and it's very, very important to look at the level of saturation in each curve to decide where I should be spending my next dollar. Let me take you through a very concise exercise in order to illustrate the concept of ROI being high doesn't necessarily mean that we should be investing more on that channel. In the chart you see in my screen now, we have two channels. We have the TV and the search. And actually, if you compute the ROI, you would find that the TV ROI is higher than the search one. But what I will be doing now is that I will be decreasing the budget of television and that same amount, I'm, be, I'm going to place it on the search activity. What happens is the following. Because I have decreased my budget on television, I will be having a decrease in the contribution that is coming from television or the revenue that is incremental that it was generated by the investment in television. Now, that same money that I have invested in search will help me increase the contribution that is coming from search. Because search is not as saturated as television, that's why what I gain from search will be higher than what I lose from television. So the net equation is actually a gain. So by keeping the same budget by switching and switching budget from television to search, I was capable of improving my total net revenue. And that's exactly how optimization works. Let me dive deeper into that and take you through a detailed example. Let's assume that I have 50K dollars to invest in three channels, TV, radio, and display. First step in any uh, optimization algorithm is actually to derive the diminishing return curves for the three channels, meaning TV, DR curve, radio DR curve, and display DR curve. Then what we'll be doing next, is that we'll be splitting that 50K budget into increments, let's say 10, and then 20, and then 20. And then we'll be using the slope and the comparison of the slopes of the three diminishing return curves to decide where to put that first 10K, then that next 20K, and finally the last 20K. So the first increment is 10K. So the question I am asking myself, if I put 10K on display, how much revenue I will get? All what I need to do is to project the 10K on the display curve. If I put the same 10K on television, how much will I get? Same drill. If I put 10K on radio, how much will I get? So actually, this is what I call the marginal return, going from 0 to 10, how much revenue, incremental revenue I will get. Now, if I compare the three lines, the orange, the blue, and the green one, we notice that the highest one, the tallest one, or the highest slope is actually for television. And for that reason, I'm going to place those 10K on television. The starting point was 50K budget to allocate to three channels. In the beginning, we had zero investment in television, radio, and display. At the end of iteration one, we have established that the steepest slope is for television, and hence, the first 10K will be allocated to television. So what I have now is zero investment in display, zero investment in radio, and 10K investment in television, and I still have 40K to place. And that's what I'll be trying to do in iteration two, which consists in placing the next 20K. Now I have an additional 20K to invest. In order to decide on which channel I should be investing this money, I'll be doing exactly the same thing. If I place 20K on television, how much will I get? If I place the same 20K display, how much will I get? If I place those same 20K in radio, how much will I get? And I'll be comparing the marginal returns or the slopes. If you compare now the green, the blue, and the, uh, the orange one, you realize that actually the blue one, which is the radioactivity slope, is the highest. 
Remember that in television, we won't be starting from zero because we have already placed it at 10K. So if I am going to place an additional 20K in television, it will take me from 10K to 30K. So when I look at the marginal return, it will be the marginal return I will get from moving from 10K to 30K and not from zero to 20. So at the end of this exercise, what happens is that given that radio exhibits the highest slope, that's why those next 20K will be placed in radio. Here, we are going to follow exactly the same methodology while remembering that for radio, I'm not starting from zero. I already have placed 20K. For TV, same. I'm not starting from zero because I have already placed 10K. However, for display, I did not place any money and I'll be doing my count from zero. So now the last 20K, where should I place them? Same drill as before. I have already placed 10K on television. An additional 20K, how much will it give me in terms of slope or marginal return? Same thing for radio. I have already invested 20K in radio. An additional 20K, how much will it give me in terms of incremental revenue? Same for display, if I add 20k to zero display, how much revenue I will get. And I will be comparing the size of the orange, the blue and the green arrow. And you clearly see actually that the highest slope is again for television. So my decision is to place the last 20k in television. So what is now my final optimal allocation? TV gets 30k that's 10k from iteration 1 and 20k from iteration 3 or the final iteration. Radio gets 20k in iteration 2 and display doesn't get any money. So the optimal allocation of the 50k that gives me the optimal revenue is actually placing 30 of them in television and 20 of them in radio. Optimization process. What I would like to share with you in this slide is actually the essence of my experience when it comes to running many optimizations in many marketing mix modeling projects. There are five steps that I really advise you to follow in order to be capable of creating a sound optimization result for your clients. The process starts at the creation of ad stock or decay variable. As you know, when consumers are exposed to media, they will be absorbing the message, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be running to the stores to buy your product. There's some kind of carryover effect that needs to be accounted for. And in order to account for that effect, we use transformations like ad stock in order to account for this. Some algorithm will go even further and you can create an ad stock that actually models the short term and the long term effect of advertising. We will be covering this in another session. But let's say that as a first step, you need to build in some kind of carryover to your variable. Now, second step is to add a diminishing return component to your variable because ad stock or DK is a linear function. It doesn't give you the concavity that will allow you to optimize very essential to apply some kind of functional form that will allow you to have the, the, the shape, the concave shape that I have showed you earlier on. For example, exponential function would be one of those functions that can help you achieve that outcome. In the exponential function, for example, there, are, there is a parameter that you can vary. And the idea here is that you won't be created only one curve. You will be creating many curves by varying that parameter. And that parameter actually controls your saturation. So we'll be creating different shapes of concave curves. And when you move to the next stage of the modeling, and you will be applying a genetic algorithm or any kind of uh, model selection algorithm, that's where you will be finding out the right curve that should go into your optimization while controlling for all the other factors in your model. So it's very, very important that you look at the shape of the curve that you are creating, that when you visualize those curves, they make sense to you. They shouldn't be really very highly saturated or not at all saturated, because if you create curves that are really highly saturated, that means that you will never ever be putting money on that channel because it's already highly saturated. If you create curves that are almost linear, that means that the more money 
you put on that channel, you will keep increasing your revenue. And what your algorithm will do, it will be investing all the money on that channel. So try to go for curves that are realistic. If you get stuck, ask your manager or ask some people from the business that have been exposed to this type of curves in order to guide you when it comes to the creation of those curves and more importantly, the size of the parameter that you will be defining. Once I have find out the best curve that really fits my data. So those curves will then be fed into the optimization in order to allocate the budget optimally. The last advice that I want to give you in this section is actually optimization is not an exercise that you would do in a closed room. Very important that you get the input from the business, from the media planners, because sometimes there are constraints that are related to reality that you need to account for. For example, there is a limit of inventory in a specific media channel and you couldn't be investing more than a certain amount. So you need to take that into consideration. Or there is a minimum of an investment in a specific channel. Again, that minimum should be, should be taken as a constraint in your optimization exercise. So whenever you come at that last step, step please make sure that you involve people from the business that can help you enhance the quality of your optimization exercise. So you deliver to the business insights that are actionable and implementable. Continuing with advice and tips, I would like to leave you with the following one. Please perform your optimization and modeling iteratively. It's not a sequence. You shouldn't be in a situation where you finalize your models and then you start your optimization because you could discover very bad surprises. For example, you have created your model, you have computed your ROI contribution, everything is perfect, and you have reported your results to the business. Then the business asks you to do an optimization of the back of that modeling. When you run the optimization, you discover that some of your channels are highly saturated and the other ones are not at all saturated. This would push any optimization algorithm not to put any money on the saturated channel and to push all the money towards the non-saturated channels. This is obviously not something that the business would accept. So that's why, while you are running your models, you need to make sure that you are keeping an eye on the results of the optimization. You can only say that I have finalized my project when both modeling and optimization makes sense to you. Contribution makes sense, ROI makes sense, and optimization makes sense. The backbone of any optimization exercise is actually the definition of your diminishing return curve. In order to define a great diminishing return curve, it's very, very important that you make sure that you transform your variables, you apply your decay, your diminishing returns, you create different curves that are sensible, and then use some kind of model selection in order to find out the right curve that should go, that should go into your optimization. There is a process that I have defined in today's course that I really advise you to follow in order to make sure that your optimization makes sense. Remember that optimization is not about moving the dollar towards the channel that has the highest ROI. It's about moving the dollar towards the channel that has the least saturation. So diminishing return curves, again, are really key when it comes to running your optimization. The next course will be about prediction or simulation or forecasting, which is actually one of the pillars of recommendations and insights to the business. Thank you very much.